Good evening, everyone. I didn't quite always know what I wanted to do, but looking back, I think that we all follow a path in our career ever since we are young. I study inflammation in the lungs, and my main research is in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD for short, as it is known. It is caused by smoking and pollution, but what is worse about this disease is that it's predicted to be the third leading cause of death by 2030. And if that wasn't enough, it has no treatment or cure at the moment. But the way I started to investigate this disease, or better say, become a researcher, started, started at an early age. My first research was conducted on ants, and it was when I was five. <laughs> then I was very interested how ants communicated with their antennas and where did they go in such a straight line all the time. So one day I went outside, I took a matchbox, well, took, a, uh, took a tiny twig and I started picking up eight or ten ants, the ones that look biggest, blackest, you know, juiciest ones. I put them <laughs> in my matchbox and I took them in my play area at home. But shockingly, they escaped from there. <laughs> uh, well, it's not shocking, but then it was. So I was absolutely distraught then. But there were other plans at play because in a couple of weeks, huzzah, a big colony in my house. <laughs> I could see them everywhere, in my room, in the bathroom, in the living room, and most importantly, in the kitchen. And then I made my first scientific discovery, which then was mind-blowing. They all go in line, they queue in line for food. Wherever it's food left unattended, they will be there. Like humans do. They were very smart as well, because they managed to avoid my mom for quite a long time. There were one or two random ones being spotting here and there, but nothing too alarming. But this experiment had to be started, uh, stopped one Sunday. See, at that age, my grandma used to make us a cake every Sunday. And in that particular Sunday, my dad, she made my favorite cake, the favorite cake for my dad. So she, he couldn't wait until after lunch to have a slice of that cake. So he went, cut a big chunky slice and went to have the first bite. Imagine you have your favorite cake and you have your first bite. The explosion of aromas, the sugar rush, and the extreme delight. Well, actually, that's what my dad was expected. Instead, I could hear a scream. See, that piece of cake was, was the home of an ant. <laughs> and the ant decided to beat his tongue, if you can imagine that. So that is when the experiment had to be stopped. <laughs> and my parents called the exterminator. I still remember it was like a black rug of dead ants everywhere. But the scientists in me didn't want to give up. So I started counting them. I reached about 152. When my mom discovered what I was doing, she gave me a good smack and she punished me for two weeks. <laughs> the signs were there from an early age that I was supposed to be a scientist, but I didn't actually want to do that until I was about eight or nine. Until then, I wanted to be a doctor and help people. Then my dad gave me an article talking about all the medical advances that will take place in 20 years' time and how it will improve our lives. But the thing that really caught my eyes was the fact that the article had a picture of a female scientist having goggles on and an extremely white lab coat. <laughs> I was very fascinated then. The first thing that came into my mind after, of course, how cool this all looks, is that, well, actually, if I'm a scientist, I can help more people by curing disease. But then I didn't know how frustrating and how much hard work it is to be a scientist. I realized that when I, came, I first came to uni, my first year of practicals was a complete disaster. So we were given the red folder. So the red folder was like a recipe book where they explained week by week what experiments we needed to do, how to do them, and the expected result. Only half of the time, and that if I'm indulgent, I would achieve the desired results. The other half, complete disaster. <laughs> I still remember that one time I had to heat up some molasses for an experiment. The folder didn't say anything about building a sugar rocket to the ceiling. 
I didn't quite do that, almost, but I did make a huge mess on my desk. <laughs> after that, after my first year, I was like, well, maybe research is not for me if I'm so terrible at experiments. But something in me still said, well, don't give up then, still. And my second year, third year came and I became better and better doing research. And in my fourth year, I, st I started studying COPD. But during that time, I was applying for PhDs as well. So I wanted, I thought then that if I study a disease that is more mediated, such as a cancer or HIV, it was better for me. I didn't quite understand that the research I was doing was truly as important as any of studying of any of the other disease. I didn't realize that until um, my granddad had a stroke and he's now paralyzed. But he didn't suffer from COPD, but he was a heavy smoker for most of his life, which ended up in him having the stroke, which made me actually more infuriated to study this disease and actually cure it. So what actually happened it happens in this disease at microscopic level? So imagine that you have a cut and you feel the pain, you see the redness and the swelling. That's a normal process in your body. Because when you have the cut, your skin barrier is breached, so bacteria get in there. And the body kind of signals an alarm and... Oops. <laughs> and um, sends, sends an alarm and asks cells to come there and clear the bacteria that has come to that, that place. These cells are called neutrophils. And what they do is they release some very acid content on the bacteria. But this acid content doesn't only kill the bacteria, but it can destroy and sometimes uh, it can destroy the cells around that area. Yeah. Although it's, an, it's a normal process, um, bilateral um, uh, problems always happen. But in people suffering from COPD, actually their lungs don't really know when to stay stop to that signal. So more and more of these cells are asked to come in their lungs when they get an infection. So the more they get in, the more toxic contents they release and the more damage they make. And if inflammation takes place afterwards, imagine that they can't breathe. And in some cases, they can die due to asphyxi asphyxiation. It's, it's very interesting how many things we know about disease today. But I have to say, the life of a scientist, to get to that point, is full of frustration. Most of the days, we are like priests, praying that our experiments actually work and we get good results to find a cure. The rest of the time, we put in a lot of work to design these experiments and to connect what we know to what we hypothesize or what ideas we have about curing the disease. If the kid in me knew then how frustrating it is to be a researcher today, probably she wouldn't have chosen this path, but I'm glad she didn't know that because that's why I am the best scientist I am today because I really want to help people. It's true that in most cases, the treatment that we find is due to serendipity, but we do have to put a lot of work behind this before a serendipitous result is found. I'm sure that the research I'm doing will fill in some gaps that we have about COPD, and I'm very optimistic to believe that we'll put a small stepping stone towards the develop development of a treatment. Until then, I have to be patient and continue doing my research, and hopefully one day my patients will be rewarded. Thank you.